Now, enough's enough, we're very close to getting the Motley Crew tour, Dr. Feelgood I'm talking about. What made Faster Pussycat get the tour instead of Enough's Enough? Well, we don't know. Uh, to this day, I, I, I like to, if I was going to speculate, I would say that they looked at our sales in Canada and they weren't as, as, as big as we thought they were. Mm -hmm. You know, we were selling records in the United States for sure, and we had a little bit of a foothold. We were just starting to uh, be a footnote on the, the radar of the American public. I'm not so sure that people knew who we were in Canada. And maybe Nikki and the boys looked at it and said, hey, you know, let's go in a different direction. Perhaps that, or maybe the relationship they had with the record company. No one will ever know that. Only the band Motley Crue can, give you, can answer that question. Uh, that would have been a great tour. Uh, however, we went out and still went out on tour on our own and you know, we played arenas and opened up for big bands and went out with Def Leppard and Cheap Trick and Badlands and the Nelsons and any tours that were out there where it was work, my, our agency at the time, which was Premier, mm -hmm. uh, they put us out there working and kept us busy. And that was a, that was a good time for us because we really got a chance to open the eyes and ears of a lot of people out there. And the people that were listening to music on MTV were listening with their eyes instead of their ears, basically. Uh, but the real diehard fans and, and the musicians, the great bands that were out there, really took note and embraced us. Now, I was very excited to see, but it never aired, the version of Bands on the Run on VH1. Um, do you have a copy of it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it was great. It was us against Bow Wow Wow. Whoever sells, you get two days to go out and you play one show. Whoever sells more merchandise and draws more people wins the contest. You win a half a million dollar deal and you go over to Germany and you start a tour over in Europe. And we won the contest and nothing ever happened after that. So uh, perhaps it was one of those things where you know, it's a mirage. They say it's there, but it's not. You see it, but you don't. Uh, but it was a fabulous show, really entertaining. You know, they had some guests that came on. Stephen Adler came on the show with us and was hanging out with us at, in Las Vegas, walked around naked in the parking lot. Uh, there was a little bit of substance abuse in there, so it was a little bit R-rated of a show. Uh, but the people, the powers that be at MTV, especially Rick Krim, I thought did a fabulous job of putting that whole show together. And uh, it was good for us because it gave us a shot in the arm and gave us some confidence that there was still gas in the tank of Enough's Enough. And maybe one day, it'll, uh, maybe one day I'll be able to release that so the fans can see that because it's really an entertaining show. I got a chance to play a couple songs live. Vicky Fox was on the show again, so it was the whole team getting back together again and reacquainting ourselves with those songs and uh, getting up in the morning and doing those radio shows and promoting and and really uh, hustling every single day. And that's what we won because we're a hustling band. We move quickly and we strike when the iron's hot. If I remember right, your wife is co-writing Jack Russell's book, obviously, with Jack Russell. What's the progress on this? Yeah, my wife, Kate Catalina, a uh, great journalist, wonderful writer. She was chosen out of a bunch of different writers to take on the task of putting that novel together. It's a great book, exposing all those uh, Scars and tattoos that Jack Russell's Great White carries. Wonderful storytelling. A lot of big stars in the book, too, mm. uh, she, that she's interviewed. And I thought it was fabulous. From the old management company down to the record company, Catch, you know. And John Collagner's in the book. It's great. And a bunch of musicians as well. It really shows how the empathy and the respect that Jack had for not only his career, but for the people that... Um, they lost in that fire and that whole incident. It was very uh, tra tragic, one of the worst tragedies ever in rock and roll. And uh, he's, he lives with that every single day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that in the book, it really exposes uh, how he feels about that and um, the love he has for the fans and their families. And he's proud of his career. He sold, they sold 15 million records. They did very well for themselves. They're still out there touring. so. Uh, I think it's a very well-written book. I've only I went through a couple of chapters on it. She was she that my wife was kind enough to read to me, and it, it's it's a fabulous right read. It really is. She did a great job, and hopefully uh, the book will be released sometime in 2024. And it's such a well-written book that I think it'll be a movie. Awesome. Now, speaking of books, you've been writing one for three, four years, or something like that. Yeah, I'm not ready to go yet. There's still stories. There's still gas in that tank. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, maybe in 2024.
speaking of your wife, Kate Catalina, she has a solo record called Saint Civil Cemetery coming out at some point. Is there a release date for it? Yeah, I'm not sure she's going to call it that now. She's uh, she's had second thoughts on the title of, of the band, uh, but the record is uh, finished, and uh, there's some great musicians that are on there too. Uh, Derek Sharanian from mm -hmm. Black Country Communions on the record, along with Joe Hoekstra from White Snake. I produced the record, so she's got the Enough Snuff name on there too. But all I did is produce it. She played all those parts, sang every single note. Wonderful songwriter. And I'm not just saying because of my wife. She is the real deal. It's like a cross of uh, Lana Del Rey meets Fiona Apple. They fight in an alley, and it's Kate Catalina. She is <laughs> the real deal. All those songs are great. And a lot of those songs she wrote when she was... 11, 12, 13 years old, and wow. now they're finally, after 20 years, they're finally going to see the light of day. Now, while playing Club Soda and hanging with Bob Rock, did you ever discuss Bob Rock producing maybe Enough Enough? Yeah, Bob came out to see us in 91 when we were playing at Club Soda in Vancouver. Uh, knocked on a dust bus door, I seen him, and I looked, he looked familiar, and I opened the door, he goes, hey, I'm Bob Rock, are you a chip? I said, yes, I am. He goes, hey, I, man, I came out to see the show, I go, come on in. We got in the bus, and he's a wonderful storyteller, great musician. I had no idea that he played all those parts and all those records. And uh, he can sing, too. He does it all. He's a great, he really is a fabulous uh, artist. And uh, we sat and talked, and he goes, you know, I'd really love to produce Enough's Enough. You guys, you guys have your own unique timber and sound. I love the songwriting. Uh, but we just didn't have the budget at the time. We would have, looking back in hindsight, I really wish we would take the chance there, but I'm certainly not bummed out about the, the the road we took. We had Paul Lanny uh, co-produce the record with us, and we did it in Los Angeles, and we recorded a double record. Only one record came out, 14 songs on that strength record. Uh, but I'm proud of the work on there. Donnie and I were writing machines at the time. Donnie was singing his ass off. We just, every day while we were recording, after we'd record some stuff, then we'd go in another room and we'd write another song. We came up with a lot of material, and at the end of that record, and everybody came down to visit us too. The guys in Cheap Trick and Steve Salas and uh, I think, uh, Dweezil Zappa came down there and you know actresses like Jennifer Connelly. Everybody came to visit the band. It was, and it was a really a, a wonderful time to celebrate music uh, with all your constituents in the same room and we're all smoking pot and hanging out. And, and, uh, and it was just a, it was just really a great time. And then I remember when we finished the record, the label finally came down. Yeah, Atco Records, Derek Showman, and he, he listened. He stayed was in the studio for like three hours, and, and when we finished the last song, the thirty-second song on the record, and he says, uh, "Guys, we have a we have a good problem here." And we said, well, "What's the problem?" And he says, "Too many good songs." He goes, "There's too much information right now." He goes, "We got to cut it down," and then we chopped the record down to the fourteen songs that you hear on Strength right now, and then we kept the other material for later records like. Uh, Peach Fuzz and Tweaked mm -hmm. and records down, down the line. Any good stories from from getting around on the Nirvana tour bus? Yes, it, it was a fun little time. We we, we were we were in a, different, a, a situation where we didn't have a big budget. We ran to one of the guys at the company that's rented us a bus, leased a bus to us for very cheap, and we were headlining that tour. I forgot who was opening for us, but. I think maybe it was a band called, uh, 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 damn, I got a brain cramp right now, a really good band that Scott McGee was managing, they had a song called Pain, uh, damn. in any case, we went on that tour, and that was, and it was a change of the guard at that time, so you had Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Mud Honey, Alice in Chains, all that Seattle stuff was out there, you know. And I remember um, the fans would come up to the shows, and I would I would announce at the gigs or on the radio stations that that I thought was real important that people knew that we were in the traveling in the Nirvana tour bus because <laughs> people would come out to the show just to get on the bus, and I'd have people come out and they just uh, they would pay to go on the bus and hang out with us. And 30, 40 people every single night. And it was the people who just drive in the parking lot just to see the bus that Kirk Cobain and Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic traveled in. It was just such a strange time. It was really a change of the guard at that time for in the music business for a lot of bands. Most bands like us went away, and maybe rightly so. Maybe it was time for them. But we continue to stay and, and move on and try, and try to you know, 
navigate those waters. It was a, you know, it was a certainly a tough time uh, traveling. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm so bummed I can't think of the opening band because it was a Doc McGee band, mm-hmm. and Scott McGee, that, and they had that song Pain. A guy named Michael was a singer in that band. They were so good. And uh, we did that whole tour together. We did about almost two months on a run with those cats, and uh, it was very, very well attended. We still were drawing good crowds at that time. We weren't playing 100, 200 seat venues, and it wasn't it wasn't like it is uh, in the modern days, where you, if you're not on a big tour, uh, you're going to find yourself playing the small clubs. Well, we were playing uh, nice sized theaters, and not only were the, uh, the size of the venues well received, but you also had a great radio presence. You know, radio was still playing the stuff, and MTV was still playing the videos, so. There was a little, there was some action happening for us. Unfortunately, you know, that changed really quickly on the tour. Um, we had some uh, inner, inner turmoil in the band with the record company as well. We found ourselves behind the eight ball. Management couldn't even save us on it. We sold it. The first two records sold uh, over a million records. The first mm-hmm. record was gold, second record was gold, and we still found ourselves in, in considerable debt. The record company said, well, you know, you're going to get ready to do your third record. We just want to let you know you're $750,000 in debt. And it was management that said they asked politely for a release so we could move on and, and try to get another label behind us. And we were lucky enough to find Clive Davis and Arista Records and we were able to make the next record, which was Animals and Human Intelligence. Now, you met Mick Jagger in 1983, but you also followed the Rolling Stones on tour in 1998 at the Double Door of the Four Shows. Did you meet any of the Rolling Stone guys then? I didn't meet him at that show, the Double Door. Four nights sold out the Double Door. It's no longer there. And the Double Door is now another room at, in Chicago. It's a, Now it's a bar that it used to be a, a bank. Mm-hmm. So it hasn't really caught on in Chicago because there's a lot of venues in the in south side of Chicago and north side of Chicago that bands uh, have frequented. So I was, uh, we weren't lucky enough to uh, hang out with them then. Plus, security was fucking beyond belief. People were sleeping out overnight outside at uh, on the double door. A terrible neighborhood, by the way. And people were just lined up around the block for the four days for stones. Just so, just to get in, you were lucky. Only all the only hold 800 people. Very small capacity, but a great sign of room. And I seen Cheap Trick there for a couple nights too. They were mm. fantastic. And, and a material issue and urge over a kill and up snuff. Remember, we all played there, all the Chicago bands. Um, but later on, I did. I got a chance to go see the Stones when they played Soldier Field, and their wardrobe chick introduced me to Keith Richards. And I remember walking up to Keith and saying, Keith, uh, she said, Oh, this is my friend Chip. He plays in a band called Nuff Snuff. I said, oh, Keith, pleasure to meet you. You look great. You know, I'm, we always compared to you guys in the cheap trick. And he looked at me and he waited a second. He goes, "Don't blame me." <laughs> I thought, oh, he got me right there. I shouldn't have said anything." Uh, they were fantastic, and my buddy was doing his uh, monitors for the band at the time. And then all through uh, the Stones' career, my old manager Bob Brigham, with my with my buddy Ron Prozel, they have a company called Solo Tech. They used to be called uh, Nocturne, which was Herbie Herbert's old company. Mm-hmm. They do all the big screens behind the stage, so those guys do all the Stones and. and McCartney and all the big bands out there. So, anytime the Stones came through town, I would be able to go see them. And the last time they were out, uh, my buddy was the road manager of it, so he got me a pass, and I was able to go hang out with everybody in the Stones. I didn't see Mick and Keith at the show, but I seen the rest of the band. Ron Wood came there. We were staying at the Peninsula in Chicago, and I still got the laminate at my house. They're so strict; they show your face on the laminate, it has your name on there, so there's no room for error. And it's, it's pretty uh, good policy. Uh, but to be in the presence of the Stones is, is very uh, honorable. Mm-hmm. I think they're a quintessential band of my generation, for sure. And uh, those guys will still be out there playing shows. And you know, I see pictures of Keith every once in a while smoking a joint. I go, wow, how do these guys do it? You know, there's something special about that band. Not only with the songs, but just the way they carry themselves. It's a, really a, one of the greatest bands of all time. Now, you did some writing with Sean Kelly of Crash Kelly in the back of a tour bus in the UK. Did anything get recorded? Yeah, I think, I think Sean did some stuff on it. By the way, Sean Kelly's got a book out right now. Yes, he does. So people can go get that book, and it's, he's, it's, he's very well read. Yeah, good musician. We had a lot of fun. We shared a bus together, went around the country. I, 
I remember some good times hanging out in some of the pubs over in uh, Ireland, Dublin, and Belfast. Uh, just a wonderful guy to hang out with. I had my 12-string bass. He was fascinated by that because I got it from Tom Peterson, a cheap trick. <laughs> he thought that was pretty cool, and he liked the school that we were from, where we grew up listening to a lot of stuff from across the pond. And, you know, we loved the Squeeze, the Beatles, and Elvis Costello, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and, and Sex Pistols. And he thought that was kind of a nice little combination, putting all those bands together in a blender. Mm -hmm. He came up with some good stuff. There's a lot of influences right there. Now, Nelson and Enough Enough are both very different bands. Other than touring together, another thing in common is the track We're All Right, that the Nelson version has different lyrics. What do you think of the Nelson version of it? I think the Nelsons did a fine job. Of it. They, wanted, they asked us directly if it was okay if they changed some of the stuff in the song. And we said, certainly. You know, so we, we wanted you guys to turn it into your own thing. We still got the credit on. We still got the publishing on the song. They were mm -hmm. very kind about that. We split everything up equally. They did a couple of songs. Uh, uh, they recorded for enough, uh, enough, enough songs on the record, along with uh, uh, Paul Gilbert from Mr. Big. He yeah. did a couple of songs too. Uh, I thought it was nice. There, it was respectful, and that's what they heard. And that's and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm glad that we got a chance to share the spotlight, and and share uh, a record together. I think it's uh, it's part of our history. And I, I think that those kids did a great job. Agreed. Now, members of Cheap Trick, Metallica, Dope, Kiss, Disturbed, Kid Rock, they're all fans of Enough's Enough. Has there have been talks of an all-star tribute album to the band? No, we never talked about that. We're, we're grateful that those guys have recognized it all. Little Steve used to say to me, Chip, be grateful to be just a fucking footnote in the business. And he's absolutely right. There's, you know, we're at a time right now where there's too many, there's too much product, not enough demand. It's, it's very difficult for any band out there. So. For us to be recognized whatsoever is a miracle in itself. And it's nice that those bands have paid homage to enough stuff. Hey, we've been going for a long time. We're not a flash in the pan. We're a band that uh, believes in what we're doing, and we're going to continue to do this as long as we can. And there's still some gas in the tank. <laughs> now, um, when Dissonance was released, around that time, Jakey e. Lee wasn't heard from forever. <laughs> now, how much did he actually play on Dissonance? He played on most of the record. He came down to the studio. In Las Vegas, uh, the producer thought it was a good idea for Jakey to come on down because we were basically a three-piece band. And um, uh, his name is Vinny, the producer, and uh, he also played Vinny Costaldo. He actually uh, played drums on that record, and he's a fabulous producer as well. And he said uh, he knew what Jakey Lee and us shared the stage together in the old days when we toured together with Badlands. So when Jakey came down, he walked into the studio with a, a bottle of Jim Beam and a SG guitar, no case. And he had a cast on his leg, and I said, uh, I go, Jake, it's so good to see you again, buddy. What happened to your foot? He goes, ah, you don't want to hear it. I go, no, please share with me. He says, I was, uh, I seen the ice cream truck driving down the street, and I ran outside and chased it down to purchase some uh, ice cream, and uh, I, I tripped over the curb and broke my ankle. I said, ah, what a drag, man. He goes, hey, but I can still play. And so we played on a song, and after the song, I play on Dissonance and uh, the title track. And then he said to us, he goes, you know, I can listen to you and your brother sing and play all day. I go, man, I'd love you to play on the record, and, but we don't have any money. How about if I just give you a point on the record? And then he goes, yeah, let's do it. So there's, I think, 11 songs on the record. He played on eight of them. Oh, cool. cool. The other lead guitar stuff is mostly me. Nice. Now... How close was Steve Stevens and Billy Idol's band to joining Enough's Enough at one point? Yeah, we did talk about that back in the early 90s uh, when uh, the late, great Derek Frigo and Donnie were button heads. I didn't want to make a change, but it was talked about, and Steve told management that he would love to join the band. He, he used to sit in with us all the time and play shows, come up for the encores and play with us. Uh, but he, uh, he wanted too much money, and, and we just didn't have it. So... It, it, was, it was a dysnomaly, it just never happened. Uh, but man, uh, I, I never wanted that to happen. I love Steve Stevens, he's a wonderful friend. We had great times together. Him and Donnie would get together and they'd be locked away for two, three days, couldn't even find those jack-offs. They'd be hiding in a hotel room, you know, no one could find them anywhere. Uh, man, we couldn't imagine what they were doing. Uh, but Derek was a big part of the, uh, of the Enough Snuff sound. He's really, uh, he had his own timber on guitar and he'd keep going to the studio and he plugged that Jackson in, and he, and he would play, you know, everything one two takes on those solos. And, you know, this this was not a guy sitting in the studio for ten hours coming up with a great solo. We comp it. He was playing all this stuff in one or two takes. 
He's a fabulous player. His father, obviously, was Johnny Frigo, mm -hmm. who played with Count Basie and Billy Holiday and all the big artists. So Derek, he had, he had great schooling from his dad. But I never wanted, to, I never envisioned an ending. I always wanted Derek in the band. I never wanted him out. Uh, he was strong-armed and pushed out by Donnie in 93 after the Animals and Human Intelligence record because they fought over a song that Donnie said it was going to be a piano solo and Derek says, no, it's going to be a guitar solo. And that was, the, that was the end of it right there. A small little thing like that, musical direction that took a turn for the worst and no one could say anything because Donnie was the front man of the band at the time. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't say much about it. We, it was really disheartening to be honest with you and still is to this day. Uh, and, but I, I, we have those records, and we still had Derek playing a lot of stuff going through our career. I saved all that, all that material, and I made sure that he was a part of the. Of the I made sure that he was a part of our, the fabric of what Enough Stuff was all about in those early records, and I, I think people appreciate that. Paul and Ringo, of course, from the Beatles, signed off on Hard Rock Nights. Did you hear any feedback from them about the album? No, just uh, management company said they're you guys are going to be cool with you putting the record out. There's not going to be any problem. And it's just as long as those guys get there, just do. They own the publishing. It's their songs. <clears throat> they were fabulously written. I just took it and I tried to do a reinterpretation of those Beatles songs. So I pictured the Beatles in today's day and age with through, playing guitars through Mesa Boogie and Marshall amplifiers and with big drums. That's all. <laughs> it's just a reinterpretation. We're not a tribute band. We're not a cover band. Uh, but they're one. Of, they're a big reason of our existence. We've always com been compared to them, and it was really a bucket list to do a record like that. Not many bands have done a Beatles record all the way through, and it was all songs right. through from 1967 through 1970. And uh, basically, it's us in the studio bashing out live with a few little overdubs. That's why it's such a good record. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Chip. That was a lot of fun. All right, Ryan. Appreciate you talking to me over here. I love Toronto. It's a beautiful country. Love your wine. Love your women love the music industry out here when uh, people really just want to go they, they embrace the new rock and the old rock the new rock is happening you've got some bands like the struts out there and the lemon twigs and Greta van fleet and dirty honey and rival sons it's really good music that's out there right now and there's a lot that i'm missing okay mm -hmm. and it, it fits right in with the great bands of yesterday too so uh, it's a good scene i'm looking forward to uh some real good stuff happening for in the, in the upcoming years with not only concert festivals <laughs> Because nowadays we're in a, a day with consolidation where bands are playing together. Uh, but just new music out there for people to listen to on all formats around the country.